you so much for joining us here at the Research Her, the show working to improve the health disparities for women of color one topic at a time. I am Alicia. I'm here learning and growing with you as we research our way to well-being. Hey, y'all. So before we get started, I just want to let you all know that I am looking to learn more about you. So if you can go ahead and fill out the survey that is within the show notes, please. It is helping me with finding sponsors and being sure that I understand who I am speaking to. So please go ahead and fill out that survey and let's get started. So today we will be talking to our great sis, Teresa Alexander, who is currently pursuing a PhD in plant physiology at the University of West Indies, Trinidad and Tobago. Teresa did her undergrad degree in physics at Morgan State University, where she worked in a research lab studying cancer biology and insect biomechanics. After graduation, she spent two years as a research fellow at Harvard, discovering a passion for plant physiology. She is also the co-founder of STEM Noir, a scientific research conference and retreat for Black women. Without further ado, let's talk to our grace sis, Teresa Alexander. I like to start the interview off with icebreaker questions. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> okay, so what does an exciting day look like for you? An exciting day would be so I used to go on hikes every weekend. And at 6 a.m., I would be in my car heading off to a point, a meetup point to do this hike with another group of people. Mm. If you had to eat one thing every day for the rest of your life, what would that one thing be? Butter pecan ice cream. (laughs) (laughs) Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, that's it. Okay, and if you could break the law one time, what would you do? Go over the speed limit by 100. (laughs) (laughs) So just like... Drive as fast as you Just can. Run it down the street. Did you always know that you would get into plant science? I did not know at all that I would have gotten into plant science. I was so focused on aviation and aircrafts and even designing aircrafts and flying aircrafts that I didn't even know that scientists were a thing. I didn't know that plant science was a thing. So I had this interest in like astronomy and extraterrestrial studies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's why you chose to pursue your degree in physics in undergrad? Yeah, that's partially why. Before I even went into my bachelor's degree program, I was an associate degree student Mm -hmm. and I was doing aviation then. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit more about like not knowing that you could be a scientist? So did you not see any people around you who were scientists, let alone plant scientists? I never met a scientist. I never asked about it because I didn't know it really existed, really. I never saw it on TV. You know, you would see shows and programs on TV, but it wasn't local programs or anything like that. So even if they had mentioned it, it wasn't something that I sort of related to where I was. Maybe that wasn't something that was attainable here because I never saw or met like a Caribbean scientist. And at what point did you realize that that was an obtainable goal? Not until I was an undergraduate um, studying physics and I was sort of looking to find out like what I could use my physics degree for. So that's when I was sort of directed to research programs on campus. And that's how I found out this is what you can do with it. While you were working on your undergrad degree, you were at John Hopkins working on an internship. How did that work? On my campus, when I first discovered the research programs and I got into the Mark Scholars Program. This was my first year of undergrad. So the Mark U Star Scholars Program is Minority Access to Research Careers. It's funded by the NIH. And the program starts you off in your junior year. At the time, because I was a transfer student, 
I thought that I would have had just a couple of years left at Morgan to graduate my degree in physics, but I actually had more years <laughs> than just two. But I still got into the program and I spent two years there. So the program takes you for two years and at the second year, you're supposed to graduate out of Morgan. It's really a program that's designed to take the students to conferences, support you during your time as a sort of like a research assistant in a lab. You sort of learn how to do research and in different fields, um, and they take five students a year. What was that like? So did you have to move or was it local? Like Morgan and Johns Hopkins are actually pretty close to each other. So it was just a one bus ride, which probably took like 15 minutes. It was like the street. The reason why I chose to go to Hopkins is because I didn't find any research projects on campus that I liked. I started off doing like physics research and I I thought it was so boring on campus. I went to the seminar and there was this guy from Hopkins who was presenting on his research and I approached him after the seminar and I was like, hey, can I see your lab? (laughs) You know, because it was like biophysics. I was like, oh, say, so you smash biology and physics together and then you're doing this stuff. It looks really cool and interesting. So he was like, yeah, come visit me, come visit my lab. And I did. And I really was interested in what he was doing. And the work was in cancer biology and it was really more like drug design. Mm -hmm. So I was like, yo, you know, I have family members who have suffered from breast cancer and this kind of hit home for me. So I was like, I definitely want to try this out. So that's how I started doing research in his lab. There, were you working with cockroaches? No. So that was my second advisor at Hopkins. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) In 2011, I worked with the guy in the cancer biology area. The summer of 2011, the Mark You Start program, it's required for us to do an externship. Mm-hmm. At that time, I wasn't so sure that I wanted to continue the kind of research I was doing with the first advisor. He was also a terrible advisor. Mm-hmm. And it really was his sole grad student in that lab that kept me feeling supported mm-hmm. and made sure that I was okay during that period. So I was like, okay, I think I need to sort of get into a lab where I know that the mentor mentee relationship would be enriching for me because of that bad experience. So I was kind of like on the search for something a little different in research. And also to make sure that the mentor was great for me. So I started kind of asking around. I asked the director of the Mark Ustop program on my campus, you know, like, do you know of anybody who is in kind of like biophysics work? And she's like, yeah, like, why don't you check out this guy? He's at Berkeley. And he came and did a presentation at Morgan as well. And it was really interesting stuff. Check out this lab. Uh, Maybe you can do your summer internship there and see if that's something you like. So I checked it out. I was like, hell yeah. Like it was biomechanics. I was like, I don't know what the hell biomechanics is. This stuff looks real good. Like, you know? She's like, okay. So she emails him, but he never responds to her. And she was like, well, the summer is coming. You might want to do some footwork and make sure that this guy knows that you're really interested in stuff or else you're going to have to find something else. I was like, nah, I'm going to this lab. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I contacted him. I called him. I got him on the phone. I was like, listen, <laughs> I'm really interested in your work. I'm this student. I've been doing this. I'm really interested in doing this. And I saw your projects, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, you know, usually students that come to my lab, I guess like he wasn't really sold on the idea of like having a girl in his lab because He says that girls tend to get really afraid of the animals and the insects that they work with. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, yeah, well, one of the projects we're running right now, we work with iguanas. And, you know, that's a kind of scary looking animal as well as, you know, like cockroaches. I was like, oh, that sounds like where I'm from. I was like. (laughs) <laughs> like I'm accustomed to seeing an iguana on a tree. Like, I mean, I'm from the tropics. Like, this is something I usually see. And he was like, oh, okay. And then, you know, he approved me to come to his lab for the summer. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. Like, it was a transformative experience for me in terms of, like, research and just knowing that there are great mentors out there. 
So what made him a better mentor than your past mentor? Like, what was it that made your past mentor bad? How could he have done a better job at supporting you? For one thing, he wasn't telling me that I would never be good for grad school. Mm -hmm. Um, That was one of the things that stuck with me that the old mentor at Hopkins had said to me for whatever reason. I don't know why he why he even said that. And he was never a condescending type of person. If you didn't understand the information, he wasn't going to try to attack you and beat you like you're dumb for it or something. He was just very supportive of, you know, send me material or something like that because he knows I'm not familiar with it. That's not my area. He was very supportive. He wanted to make sure that even after the summer, like I was supported, like he wanted to know like, okay, so you're interested in this type of stuff. What are you going to be doing moving forward? What do you need for grad school? If you need anything for grad school preparation, like let me know. He even referred me to people in Maryland. And that's actually how I had my second advisor at Hopkins. Because after the summer, you have to return back to your home university. And I had to find a lab. And he referred me to one of his past students at Hopkins. And that's how I started working again with my cockroaches. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So how was that? At first, like when they told me I was going to be working on this cockroach project, I was like, okay, I should say the graduate student that I worked with, he was so cool and he was so great. And I think we just kind of had this really cool connection because he used to love reggae and he used to tell me about his time in Guadalupe. That's in the Caribbean region. So it's like, he used to tell me about his upbringing. So we just connected off of that and then on top of that he was just easing me into the idea of you know you're gonna have to hold the cockroach you know you're gonna have to like (laughs) do some surgeries on them and so we just kind of started holding cockroaches in the aquarium and playing with them he took me down to where they had thousands of them in like a glass aquarium and we were picking them up and telling me what's the difference between a female and a male so easing me into it and then you know once we started working on building the setup for the experiment it was so easy it was like nothing you know it was actually really exciting and I got to really use my knowledge of like physics to even just build and design the arena yeah it was great so what did you study on the roaches (laughs) on the roaches so we did a neuromechanical experiment and Basically, that lab is sort of a bio-inspired technologies lab. So what they do is they learn from animals and insects and how they locomote, meaning how they move. And then they sort of try to get to model that behavior into a robotic model. And so we were learning how the neural system and the mechanical system works together in cockroaches because they have a very simple one. And so... What we would do is we would let the cockroaches run in a northern direction and then we will apply a force in an opposite direction and observe how they correct themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, like how you see robots and they try to make their movement as realistic as possible. So if there was a robotic model that they had and it was walking and someone kicked it, they want to understand, do you need to have your neural system connected to your mechanical system to correct yourself and recover from that kick. Mm -hmm. And we found that the cockroaches do use their neural system to correct themselves so that they could continue moving forward. That's basically what it was. (laughs) That's cool. That's some cool stuff. Yeah. (laughs) The crazy, the craziest part of it was like doing insect surgery. In order to do that, we had to, insert nanowires into the hind legs of the cockroach. Mm -hmm. If you take a cockroach and you put it in the freezer, Mm -hmm. it sort of hypnotizes it. Like it's like an anesthesia for the cockroach. It doesn't move at all. But it won't die. It won't die. It's still alive. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And so you take it and you put it on its back and then you can spread all the six legs apart with these pins. Mm Mm-hmm. Without damaging, you can just kind of spread their legs out. And then you can insert a small pin into the leg of the cockroach and then insert a wire. Mm -hmm. And then sort of seal that wire into the hind leg. And what you're going to listen to from that wire is the neurons firing. Mm. 
to kind of like a system to see it. Yeah. So that's basically what it was. Did you accidentally ever pull one of the legs off of the cockroaches in this <laughs> process? No, I haven't done that. But a nasty thing I would say was one time I didn't check to see if it was a male or a female. So for the experiment, we were only using males. I know where this is going. <laughs> I took a female. I took up a female by accident. Mm. While I was preparing to do the insertion of the wire into the legs, I guess it was like frantic or something. And it started laying an egg. <laughs> I knew that's where this was going. And I started to, I, there was the one, another undergrad next to me. And I was like, what the hell is happening in here? How many was it? It was just a lot of them? No, it was like a weird cuboid kind of box. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It was just one. Mm-hmm. But I've never seen it before. And I've never seen like their thorax, the end of their abdomen open so wide. And I was like, oh, oh my God. I was like, oh. Happening here. It was so gross. So, how did you end up at Harvard? An email. Okay. <laughs> One email started this entire process. It's a crazy story. I started biomechanics in the summer of 11. I went back to my home university in 11 and started another cockroach project with my second advisor, Hopkins. The end of that year, the January, there's this conference called SICBI, which is a Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology. And a lot of the biomechanists attend this conference. And so I went there with my advisor's lab. And because he was also a past student of the summer internship advisor, we all got together. And he had also his undergrads from his lab and graduate students. So we all had dinner together one night. It was probably a table of 12 to 14 people, probably. It was just this one girl and I. So it's like a really male dominated space. And here's this one girl. So we started talking to each other and she was telling me that she was preparing to go to grad school and she was going to be at Harvard and she was going to be doing like flight biomechanics. Work. And I was like, flight biomechanics? What is flight biomechanics? So that's how I realized like there's other parts to biomechanics, basically. And when she said flight, that kind of took me back to this idea of like what I had loved, you know, like aircraft. So I was like, what do y'all do with, what do y'all do in that? So she's telling me about the fact that she works with birds and they study their flight and all this. Stuff. I was like, whoa, this sounds like some avian stuff that I would really like. <laughs> <laughs> and like a couple of months after that, I had contacted her because I had some downtime and like it was coming to the summer or something like that. It was nearing the summer, I should say. I just contacted her and she was like, you should come out here and come and spend a couple of days with me. You can stay with me and I'll show you my lab and you can meet my PI. And there's another PI at our field station and you definitely should meet with her. And I was like, okay, sure. I mean, I didn't really know her like that. But she invited me across and I was like, yeah, I'll definitely check it out because I want to make sure that the type of research I'm doing is exactly what best fits me. So I was just like, all right, let me check this out. I got to Boston. She showed me the city. She then took me to her. It's called the Harvard Concord Field Station, which is not on the main campus. So her uh, lab is off campus because they actually house large boots like an emu and a bee farm and things like that. So they need to have like this natural environment area. So it's like in a really rural part of Massachusetts. And there was only two PIs at that field station. I met her advisor and he told me all about his birds and what he does. And they showed me the different instruments they use. And then they were like, you know, you need to go meet Stacy before you leave. And I met with Stacy and I was just like blown away at the fact like, I actually met like this kind of powerhouse woman. I don't know what it was about her aura. I was just like, whoa, like there's this woman professor at Harvard and she's like pioneering some area of research that is like really crazy. It was insect flight biomechanics. I was like, okay, whatever, like whatever that is, but I checked it out. And I was like, yo, like this lady is doing some really crazy projects with like dragonflies and moths and The Bumblebee project didn't come about until I went there for the summer. Some months after meeting Stacy, 
I was looking to possibly try her lab or have some sort of experience in flight biomechanics to see if that's something I'm interested in. I just decided to just one day just shoot her a random email and she shot me back an email. You know, like you're not really expecting anything. You're just expecting them to just kind of say a couple of lines and be like, well, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe I could tell you something about it. But I was I kind of glanced at it because I was leaving school. And I was like, why did she write like three paragraphs worth of information? I don't know what this is. But let me just take my time when I get home or something. She literally was offering me a summer internship at her lab for the entire summer. And she's like, I have money. I'm going to pay you. You can come down here. When can you come? I was like, really? (laughs) Okay, sure. Yeah. It was May of 2013. I was at a summer internship at Harvard. And that's kind of just how it started off. When I finished that project, well, the project still kind of was ongoing because we spent so much time trying to build the setup for the experiment that when we started taking measurements, it was kind of like, or recording measurements. It was, it was, and this is for the bumble, like when you were doing a bumblebee study or not yet? What were you working on at this point? All right, this was the bumblebee project. Yeah, this was the bumblebee project. So we had spent so much time like on the setup itself that it kind of was ongoing. We did collect some data while I was there, but we didn't get the chance to analyze the data. So I was still sort of working from Morgan, still with them on some of the details of analyses and things like that. So it kind of carried on into 2014. And then the advisor I had at Hopkins, we basically parted ways before my summer internship. And so I just continued with their lab. And this was a time that I was supposed to be applying for grad school. And so I was just like not sold on grad school yet. Mm -hmm. One of the things that happened during that time at the summer internship was that I received some email from financial aid or either I had called or something. And they basically said to me, you've exhausted all of your funds for financial aid. I was like, what? (laughs) And this is at Morgan State? This is at Morgan. I was like, wait, what? And I was thinking to myself, I was going crazy. I was going nuts. I was like, how am I supposed to pay for school? Mm -hmm. Like, I have a whole senior year left. And you're telling me that I've exhausted financial aid, whatever that meant. I was like, I don't even know what that means. But I know it has something to do with the fact that I'm not going to be able to pay my damn school bill. Mm -hmm. So... I was kind of panicking and stuff. And then I was like, this is crazy. I don't want to go into debt. I had all kinds of thoughts going through my mind. I'm not thinking about grad school right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking about going straight back into school. And I'm already struggling. Like I've literally worked from my associate degree, worked part time. I've been in school full time since my associate degrees. And I've made some sacrifices to take on summer internships, subletting my apartment, savings and all that stuff. But I'm not trying to go back into debt. What is the point of me going to grad school now? Like, am I really, do I really want to go to grad school? Mm -hmm. Am I going to be happy here? But I did apply to grad school. I got one interview. At the interview, the advice, he was so cool. He was just like, you know, I'm just going to be honest with you, Teresa. I'm not taking students right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Dude, why am I here? Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He was just like, you know, I'm about, I really think that I want to retire soon. I have a couple of students. I'm really staying on for the students that are already here. I'm not trying to take new students, check out the department. You know, I was just like, I don't even like Seattle like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was back at Morgan. So I had gotten some sort of aid that took away most of the financial burden, right? I was out of the mock program at that time because the contract ended for that. But then I went straight into another program, which is called the MBRS RISE program, which is also a minority research program to support minority students in research careers. Mm -hmm. So I was getting funds from there and I had some portion of funds that paid tuition. So I was okay. Feeling like a poor student, I didn't want to go straight into grad school, but because it's a requirement of the programs, you're supposed to be applying to go to grad school and things like that. And I was just like, well, maybe let me just see what happens kind of thing. And that's how I ended up applying to grad school. 
I did have one interview out of it. And then he said that I was like, all right, I guess I'm not going to grad school. From that actual interview situation, I had a conversation with the Harvard PI. She was saying like, oh, so what are you like? What are your plans? Like, what are you thinking about doing? Like, if this doesn't work out? I was like, I think it isn't going to work out. I was interviewing at the University of Washington, Seattle. Okay. At the biology department. And why were you thinking about switching over to biology at the time? Because you had been dealing with the insects for the past few projects? Yeah, because I felt like that's where that type of research would be found. So I just took on a biology department. Actually, all of the programs I applied to was all in biology departments Mm -hmm. because all the biomechanists were in that department. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why. When I was talking to my advisor, the summer internship advisor, I was like, I don't think that I would get through and I don't think like moving forward, like I'm not really sure about what I would do next, but maybe I'll do a master's, blah, blah, blah. And then she was like, you know, I received this strange email the other day. (laughs) There was this lady, I don't really know who she is, but she sent me an email asking me for you to come back for like a year or something. And I'm not really sure what the details of it is. I could send it to you and you could tell me like, are you interested in something like this? I was like, sure, why not? Like, I don't care, I don't have a plan. Like, what do you mean? She sent me the email. I'm still at Morgan in my senior year. I looked through the email and it's basically they're like offering a fellowship to come back and do research. And she was saying, you know, I would be your PI and you would work with me. Yeah. Where was that at? Where would you have been going? So it was basically a Harvard fellowship through the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. I think the time period of the fellowship wasn't finalized. So that was kind of like open. But it was an offer to have a Harvard fellowship for some period of time um, that she would be my PI. And I was like, okay, sure, why not? I don't have a plan. I mean, I feel like this will kind of give me some time to really see if, you know, going into a PhD program is something for me. Because I don't feel like a summer internship is ever going to really tell me Mm -hmm. what that experience will really be like. And I took it. So right after I graduated, I headed off to Boston. That's how it all started. And once I got there, I was told by the PI that I was supposed to be working with that she took a position at UC Davis and she was going to be leaving. (laughs) Wow. You know, I understood because I knew that her family was in California Mm -hmm. and she wanted to be near her family. So it made sense. But at the time, it kind of left me kind of hanging in a way because I was like, I don't even know anyone else in this department because I was at the field station, which is really separate from the main campus. And so I had to do some shopping around online, basically looking at different labs. And the only person that said something about physics was this plant lady. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I was like, Mm -hmm. plants and physics? Like, what the hell is that? I don't make sense. I I believe I contacted her and I went to visit her lab and we were talking and she's showing me instruments and I'm at the lab and, you know, they're really welcoming people and peachy people and happy, you know, like they look really happy and relaxed. I was like, this is a good environment. I'm feeling the vibe here. She took me to the greenhouse. I saw tropical plants there. I was like, oh, this feels like home, you know? They had like a growth chamber in the basement where they had other plants. And they were like, you know, during the wintertime, we might still need to collect things. So we have some trees in this growth chamber here. And it was just really cool. And it made me kind of connect back to my home life. Mm-hmm. I kind of knew that plant biomechanics existed. But I never actually looked at it as something that I would do until that time. So like when I had decided like, okay, I'm going to be in this lab. She welcomed me in and I started, you know, hanging out with all the grad students and stuff. I immediately started working on a project with one of the postdocs. It was in xylem function and I didn't even know what xylem really was. (laughs) I didn't really know anything about like plant biology, but I felt like maybe if you just kind of start me off on like taking measurements and stuff, I'll learn it along the way, which I did. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I just started really connecting with like plant physiology as my thing because I realized too 
that from my experience working with cockroaches and my experience, you know, seeing people working with like with, with animals, I knew like that wasn't something that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And this is a kind of weird reason why. There was a point in time over the summer internship when I started working with cockroaches where we kept the cockroaches, the ones that we used for trials, we would keep them. Mm-hmm. But then one day I saw the PI of the lab going in the freezer. I saw a bag of just dead cockroaches. Mm-hmm. This is like at the end of the summer. I'm like, y'all kill them? He was like, yeah, we have to euthanize them and put them, just put them in the freezer and leave them there. I'm like, what? Mm-hmm. It was like so many of them. I was like, oh my God, I don't know if killing things. <laughs> and then when I was working with Stacy at the Harvard Concord Field Station, there was a project happening in the same room with birds. Mm-hmm. And we had to hold the bird down just to put like marker dots on the bird. And the bird just let out this scream. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, I cannot work with animals. And I was just like, I cannot work with animals. So when I started working with plants and we were just kind of like cutting branches and stuff, they don't flinch, they don't scream, they don't like beat up. I mean, I don't have to feel bad about it because they're going to grow back this leaf, you know, like it's it's okay. So I kind of felt confident in that way. That was another connection that I made. And then also when I had to like collect data, I would go outside and pick up one of the pruners and the clippers and be under a tree and picking leaves. And it just felt like I was at home, mm-hmm. but I was doing like a science experiment. Mm hmm. So you had to do a second round of applications then, right? At what point did you start reapplying for grad school? So my fellowship was decided for two years. And the reason why was because they felt like a year wasn't enough for me because, you know, plant biology is something brand new to me. Mm-hmm. So you're we like, you should spend two years here. The end of 2015 was the second round. And here I am with some trashy looking GRE grade, you know, and I'm just like, <laughs> I got to I got to apply to grad school again. Damn. Mm-hmm. And I had to sit down with my advisor at the time. And she said to me, you know, Teresa, where do you want to go? Mm-hmm. And I said, somewhere warm. <laughs> Period. <laughs> you know, because my first year living in Boston was there was a blizzard. Mm-hmm. I had never experienced anything like that in my life. You Have you seen snow up until that point? No, I've seen snow, but I haven't seen that much snow <laughs> in my life. Like, I literally, it was waist high. Like, I was like, what is this? And I remember one of my roommates, we were in the backyard. It was waist high, and I was trying to help him shovel out his car. I was like, yo, this is not, I don't, I, no, this isn't for me. No. I, yeah, no. So... And it's freezing cold. Like, I mean, I lived in Maryland. <laughs> Comparing Maryland to Massachusetts, like, temperature-wise, mm-hmm. like, no, like, Massachusetts is so much colder, and their summers are shorter. Mm-hmm. So I just felt like, yo, I can't be in a really cold place. I'm not happy. I'm miserable here. Mm-hmm. The things that I wanted to do, get back into health and fitness or like going on hikes. The lab was like, we would definitely go places together, but it was more like lakes. <laughs> and I'm not a lake place. I'm a tropical person. I don't do still water. I do waves, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Even water. So I was like, ponds and stuff is just not my thing. <laughs> Yeah, I was miserable there. Uh-huh. So I told her, I was like, she first thing she asked me, I was like, uh-huh. so we made this list of schools. Most of the schools, I think, were in the California area and Florida. And I gave her this list for her to sort of go through it. And when she returned it to me, it was cut down to like five. I'm like, I need more than five schools. So how did she decide on which ones to cut off of the list? Did you ever ask her? So she is pretty familiar with all of the labs that I have put on there. And she's very familiar with the people. I think she was mainly concerned with like the way the PIs treat their students. She told me like, I know some stories. I know the history of behavior with some people. And I just don't feel like that's a great fit for you. So when she cut the lab list down, it was basically people she was happy with and knew that they were very supportive with their 
students and things like that. And the work was great. And she had worked with them previously too. So her lab also was on there, but I knew like Massachusetts wasn't in it. And I felt like it really wasn't about university for me. It was more about who I was going to be working with and where I would be living for possibly the next six years of my life. It was environment and the level of research and the people. That was it for me. It wasn't really the universities. But I felt like if I apply to come back to Harvard for grad school, if it's not her lab, I'm not coming back. <laughs> like, yeah. mm-hmm. So how did you choose the University of West Indies? What happened is I think I had a couple of interviews. I didn't get in. And then when I started to get the rejections, it was kind of like, okay, Tara, so you need to sit down and think about What are the next steps? She was like, you know, maybe you can think about like maybe doing a master's or maybe doing like a research assistant position or something like that. Uh, Take a year off and come back and things like that. And she was like, you want to be somewhere warm, right? Like, why haven't you thought about home? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, (laughs) I've been living in America for like 10 years. I'm not, I mean, that's a huge move, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so... That was not a thought when I was thinking about, like, going to grad school at all. So she called me in her lab, like, some days after or whatever. And she was like, I found this guy and he's doing exactly the same thing that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And I really like what he's doing. I really like the work. I checked it out. I think you should really check into this. And I did. And I was like, this sounds pretty similar. It sounds really cool. But he's not actually doing the same kind of techniques I'm using right now. While we were talking about him even more, she was like, maybe you should go and just do a master's and come back. In my mind, I was like, if I go home to Trinidad, where I'm from, and I've always wanted to go back home, I'm not going to just go there for a master's degree and come back Mm -hmm. to spend another few more years to get a PhD here. So I was looking into the PhD program and... That's kind of how it happened. I applied. I was in. I did a proposal. They approved it. And I was in that September. What has been your biggest challenge since working in academia? I would say my biggest challenge has been trying to finance it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I used to make jokes like my first three years migrants into the U.S. was like my fresh off the boat experiences, like learning about the U.S. What is this social security number thing? Like, what does that have to do with me? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, I had to finance my education. I moved to the States when I was an adult, 20. So I had had jobs in Trinidad before. I had that kind of stability in my life. And then I just kind of made that sacrifice to move and start all over again. That was such a challenge starting all over again. I had minimum wage jobs. I had to pay for my tuition. Financial aid didn't support all things. I moved out of my sister's home and then I was living on my own. And so I had to finance that life as well as being a full-time student. So that was like my hardest thing because I did that for literally seven years. Mm Mm-hmm. What would you change about your academic pursuits? I think after my fellowship, I probably would have wanted to have at least a year experience of like working in industry. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been something I would have liked to do. To actually be in plant physiology and see what I can do with that in industry. During your pursuits, did you notice that you were a Black woman in a room or was it never noticeable? (laughs) All the time, I, all the time, I always noticed it because I felt like the areas of study I was in, there wasn't many Black people, just in general. And then like to be a Black female, ugh. You know, I was like in physics and engineering, that's a male-dominated space. When you go out of like the HBCU experience, like that's a majority male-dominated space. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then it's, you know, and it's like, Even in plant physiology, I find that there aren't a lot of Black women in plant science. You know, my experience during my fellowship, I hadn't met a Black woman in plant science. Mm -hmm. We went to a conference for plant physiology, and I didn't meet any Black females there in plant science. Now you are in plant science, and you're doing wonderful research about xylem. What is xylem? (laughs) 
Xylem is like these tubes or like pipelines in a plant that transports water to the leaves and other plant tissue. So that's basically what xylem is. Mm -hmm. Does it start in the roots? Yeah, so roots have xylem. The stems of the tree have xylem. Leaves have xylem. Well, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your research. So you talk about like how structures and functions correlate to one another. So in what ways does that work with xylem? Well, the tree is, is a cacao tree. Cacao. How we say it? Mm. cacao, yeah. Cocoa is a common term that people use, but the tree is cacao tree and the cocoa is the product of the cacao tree. Mm -hmm. Cocoa butter, cocoa which you use to make chocolate. What I'm doing is working with cocoa trees or cacao trees because <laughs> there are several different varieties of cocoa. And because my project is under climate change, I'm thinking about a smart crop or a crop ideotype that could withstand the exacerbation of climate due to climate change in the future. So in the Southern Caribbean, where Trinidad is located, it's possibly going to bring drier conditions to Trinidad, which will affect agriculture in general mm -hmm. in, a, in a really bad way because it can induce drought stress. And what I focus mainly on is drought stress, but there's other stresses that can come, right? Like heat stress or whatever, but I focus on just drought stress. Xylem structure and function sort of plays in to how you can reduce drought stress. So in previous studies, xylem possibly deform in order to reduce the water loss to the environment. The vessels of xylem can deform and close, sort of. Mm -hmm. There's also talk about the shape of stomata. Stomata is where you have the gas exchange to the environment, which is under the underside of the leaf. Mm -hmm. You know what? Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so is that kind of like, is it the exchange of like the oxygen and the carbon dioxide? Or what exactly does that do? It's mainly gas exchange. So it takes in carbon dioxide and expels oxygen and water vapor as well. And xylem is all sort of connected to stomata <laughs> regulation. How do you see your research impacting the world and like science as a whole? So in terms of science, it's sort of refining our understanding of plant behavior mm -hmm. um, in general. And I just see it as I'm using cocoa as a model but there are different interesting behaviors that different vascular plants sort of have that are necessary for us to know in terms of how they regulate and behave under drought stress conditions. Yeah. In terms of impacting science, I would say that it sort of refines our understanding of plant behavior under drought stress. And in terms of like the world itself, many farmers rely on cacao because it's a, it's a cash crop. And it also kind of falls under sustainability for future generations. When I think about it, I think about the farmers and their families and their livelihoods. Got it. Do you have three tips that you can give someone who wants to study xylem structures and function? The first one I have is to just, you seriously have to have patience. When you're like doing these structure analyses, you know, it's a lot of plant anatomy work. And um, when you're dealing with such uh, intricate, delicate plant tissue, like you have to be very gentle and you just have to have a lot of patience with the work itself. And different plants have different types of leaves and, you know, one method doesn't work for the other. So that brought me a lot of frustration when I used to do plant anatomy work. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of see what these structures look like in different plants and even different varieties of plants. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, patience is key. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the other one I would say is, again, like I don't see many Black women in plant science from my experiences. And I would just say to be aware of that and just know like you have this sort of informal duty as a Black woman in, in plant science to kind of share your experiences and just inspire other women to want to engage in it and be bringing more Black women into plant science. Mm -hmm. My third would be, so we talk about structure, but in terms of like function, 
at times I found myself wanting to understand like how the plant ties into the ecosystem, mm-hmm. um, what that connection is about. And I would have to do like maybe look at canopy density and things like that, meaning that I'd have to be in the natural environment where the plants grow. Mm-hmm. So this is like dense forest. <laughs> and so I think you have to be like really open to knowing that when you're in these sort of environments, you're going to see animals that you don't usually see or you don't want to see. Mm-hmm. I've met tarantulas. Mm-hmm. I've met snakes. Like my first time in the field, I met a snake. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And how was that? Funny enough, I wasn't really scared. The other girl I was on the tree with, she ran. I don't know where she disappeared to afterwards. But it was just kind of like on the branch, just staring. <laughs> it wasn't doing anything, but maybe it was just kind of waiting for its time to grab. Mm-hmm. I don't know. That was kind of crazy. But I think the coolest thing I saw was like a, a tree frog. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like the bark of trees will have like this kind of moldy pattern on it. Yeah. I was on a tree once. I didn't realize that in front of my face was a frog. It was so oh, well man. blended into the trunk mm-hmm. of the tree. Mm-hmm. And it's not even a it's not even a small like frog. It's a huge, like kind of widespread kind of frog. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that was one of the coolest things I saw. But the nastiest thing I saw <laughs> was a tree leech. A what? A tree leech. It was like a flat, kind of wormy looking thing. Mm-hmm. And it was on the bark of the tree. And it looked, cre- I don't even know, was it a tree leech or just a tree worm? I don't know what it was. Mm-hmm. But somebody told me, I think that's a tree leech. I was like, okay, that's gross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 See, I'm, <laughs> no, this is a no for me. It's a no for me. So, what is Teresa currently working on and what can we look for from you? I'm co-founder on STEM Noir with Dr. Keelan Bishop and just continuing to work with the STEM Noir team and just really uplifting and supporting Black women in STEM. Mm -hmm. Also really trying to amplify Caribbean voices in STEM from just my experiences being, you know, a Caribbean young woman and not really knowing how to even get to become a scientist or not even knowing the different realms of careers that I can have as a STEM professional. You know, that that was not information that I was able to have back then. And also just to really show the kind of research that happens within the Caribbean region and show the people doing it. Because I have not seen that happen in my home country yet, <laughs> really. Right now, I'm being a little bit more intentional with sharing exactly what I do mm-hmm. in physiology, putting it out there in a kind of creative way to kind of make trees look really cool because they are. A lot of people have some misconceptions of what a plant physiologist is and sort of put you in that box of a botanist. And I'm like, I am not a botanist at all. Like, I have mm-hmm. not rolling all these scientific names of trees and all these different types of species. I'm like, I don't know a lot of that. So how can we connect with you after this episode? Hit me up on (laughs) on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. Facebook is just Teresa Melka. Instagram is the same, just no space. (laughs) Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for listening to the episode. If you want to connect with me, I am at The Research Her on the socials and also at TheResearchHer.com. And until next week, I holla.